Our next speaker is someone that many of us know very well. Dr. Jillian Campana, the high school theater teacher here at ASB, is also the artistic director of Studio 3 Theater, an, org an organization which focuses on social, political, and cross-cultural issues through theater. Currently, Dr. Campana is also conducting a research project in Sweden and Finland investigating the use of arts for brain surgery, surgery rehabilitation. With a PhD in theater for social justice, Dr. Campana has studied and taught the ways in which theater can better the lives of those affected by trauma. Sorry. Unfortunately, the ASB community will have to let go of our beloved Dr. Campana in a few months as she moves back to the United States to resume teaching at the University of Montana. No need to get everybody down this early in the morning, so I shall save that speech for another time. But without further ado, our own Dr. Jillian Campana. Who am I? That question plagues many of us for most of our lives, or it will. And the answer, as we've heard today, can be found in our genes. It can be found in our relationships with people, with places, with cultures. It can be found in our strengths and our abilities. And it can be found in our experiences. So today I'd like to tell you about an experience that I had that helped to shape the way that I think about identity. So let's go back in time. It's 1999, so 12, 13 years ago, and I had just earned my graduate degree from NYU. I was lucky enough to get a job as a theater professor out in the Wild West at the University of Montana. My focus was theater and social issues, and aside from teaching, acting, and directing, I taught courses like drama therapy. So, who am I? Well, I'm young. I'm not even 30 years old. I've just moved from a big city in the East Coast to a small town in the West. I'm female. Ooh, who else am I? I'm a researcher. At this point in my career, I'm interested in using theater as a tool to both conduct and write up case studies. I'm a writer. I'm working so hard to publish as much as I can to try to reach tenure in seven years. Okay, I am, it's true, I'm a workaholic. But I had a lot of fun, too. I had a great group of friends. I was very in tune with my physical life. I ran every day. I was a singer, a dancer, a painter. And about a year later, during the summer, I had my first identity crisis. I turned 30. That winter, I had my second identity crisis, a much larger one. I had a stroke. My right vertebral artery dissected because of a blood clot. The clot burst, causing an aneurysm at the base of my brain stem. And so the person that I'd been before, that healthy, active dancer, that person who never walked anywhere but only ran, was gone. Suddenly I couldn't walk again. I couldn't do any of the things that I'd been able to do. I couldn't take care of myself, let alone brush my hair or teeth. I couldn't move or speak. I didn't even look the way I did before. And that changed the way that people saw me, and it changed the way that I saw myself. It changed my identity. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Hello, I don't think she can hear me. I'm Dr. Ross. Listen, I'm going to pick up your hand. I'm holding your hand. Can you feel that? Hello? I'd like you to try to move your hand. Just, just try. Just try to move one finger. After about two weeks, I was able to move a little bit again. 
and I could speak, although my speech was slurred. The left side of my body and face drooped considerably. I had a hard time seeing, hearing, swallowing. I had no motor skills. I had very little ability to concentrate on anything, which really impaired my thinking. I'm going to ask you some questions, Jillian. I want you to try very hard to answer these, OK? Now, sometimes when someone has a stroke, it affects the way they remember and think. Can you tell me your birthday? Great. And, and how about where you're from? OK, very good. Here's a hard one. What's the name of your fifth grade teacher? <laughs> Excellent. OK, now what were you doing right before you had the stroke? What about the day before? Well, what is your last memory? Now, those first few weeks, that first month, is still a blur. It was like my brain was shifting around inside my head, trying to sort itself out. And so I, I don't remember much. But I do remember that I didn't feel like I'd been the person I was before. Everything that I could do had suddenly been stripped away, and so I felt like an entirely different person. Jillian, it's, it's time to move you. We're going to take you to a rehabilitation center, and they have facilities, and we're going to try to get you back some of what you lost. We think you can walk again, but I'm not going to lie to you. The next 6 to 12 months is going to be difficult. After that, the period of recovery, it, it slows down or it stops. And so I'll use a theatrical metaphor here. I want you to think about this as a one-woman show. So over the course of the next two years, I did recover much of what I lost. I went back to work full time. I began resuming my research. The man who had stood by my side during that recovery time, proposed. We got married. We had a child. I began acting and directing again. And two years later, I ran and finished the Chicago Marathon. But that experience, that, that feeling of momentary loss, of not knowing who I was, stayed with me. What would I have done if I never was able to go back to work? Or if my partner had freaked and ran off? or if I never learned to walk again, or if I could not remember anything. And so being the researcher, I decided to apply for a research grant to study brain injury rehabilitation. I started by looking for groups of brain injury survivors. And I came across a wonderful club called the Puzzle Club. They had started collectively by themselves and they claimed their job was to try to put the pieces of their puzzle that had been their lives back together in a different way. They met once a week without any facilitator in a restaurant in a casino just off the highway. And I asked if I could sit in on some of their meetings. The club, all 13 members of them, eventually agreed to work with me on a project to study brain injury recovery and identity. There were 13 of them, and I'd like to show you four. There was Jim, who as a firefighter had had his fire truck rammed by a speeding train. Three o'clock in the morning, July 10th, 1991, <clears throat> I didn't even see the train coming. There was Marilyn, who had suffered severe chemical poisoning, and that had left her with virtually unintelligible speech. I was a single mom. Oh, three kids to support. I'd sit down. I'd just slide to the floor. Oh, I'd become so toxic. There was Willow, who as a teenager, had been fleeing the police when she was high on drugs. I was in a coma for 
for two months. I don't want to talk about it. And there was Jeff, who had fallen asleep at the wheel. I was 17. It was the summer before my senior year in high school. I'd worked all day. I was coming home from a date. I was just a normal kid, just a normal teenager, you know? And I asked this group, including these four people, if they would work with me to help me and other people understand how they recovered and found out who they were. I like to work with you. Oh, I have a lot to say, and no one ever understands me because my speech is not what it was before. Well, I'd like to teach people about brain injuries. Yeah, me too, and the way it changes us, you know, the way we become different people. Like if you're hurt, you have so much going on in your mind. It's like you have so much up there, and you're trying to get it out every waking minute. But you just can't. You can't put it together. So I decided, being a theater person, to write a play and to use the Puzzle Club members, their experiences, and their exact words to do that. I began by interviewing all 13 of the members individually at our local hospital. I did this for several months. My brain is like a gun with six chambers. One of them is loaded. And when my mind clicks into the loaded one, I can think. And when it clicks out, well, I can't think for a bit. Oh, I was young when I had the chemical poisoning. Try chlorethylene. Try chlorethylene. Oh, it's a solvent for cleaning machine parts. Attacks your brain and blood. Oh, like I said, I had three kids. I was out of work. I was crushed. Before? Oh, man, I had confidence before. Hell yeah. Afterwards? What's the opposite of confidence? Well, I've been through two marriages. I have a daughter who's 12. I signed away my parental rights, you know, because she needs a stable home. And and, and then those divorces, they took place because of my brain injury, because it affects who you are. I was so frustrated. I just, I didn't know who I was anymore. Well, I went through some of the typical stages of brain injury recovery. One day you would walk into my room and I'd cry, and the next minute you'd walk in and I'd laugh. I went through a stage where I was cussing, and I do not cuss, but I'd I'd worked for the fire department for 20 years, so I'd heard every word in the book. After we did these interviews, I worked with the group for an entire summer doing drama workshops. We wrote scenes, and we improvised scenes, Sometimes they played themselves. Sometimes they played their doctors. Sometimes they played their friends or their family, really anyone who had helped or hindered their recovery process. And it was here that I found out that finding a sense of purpose to their lives and to this experience really helped them grapple with who they were becoming. Raise your hand if you ever wished you died in the early stages. Oh, but raise your hand if when you got better, you were glad you didn't. How about still undecided on that one? When I was in the coma, the doctors told my parents they didn't think I was going to make it. And my parents said, don't. Just If he can't breathe on his own, just don't. Don't keep him on life support. And I would have wanted it that way. I would have wanted to die, but obviously there's some reason why I'm still here. I just haven't found the purpose yet. Well, I was in a semi-coma, and I told my wife to um, pull the plug. You see, my first wife had died from a car accident. She lived four days, and I did not want my second wife to go through what I had. 
So I pulled the plugs and then I stopped eating. And my wife said I was gone for a couple of days. And when I came back around, she said, where you been at, Jim? And I said, oh, I've been out talking to people. <laughs> that was a near-death experience? I don't know. But <clears throat> ever since then, I've tried to understand why I have spirit, why I'm alive. I used to be mean. <laughs> yeah, I had a bit of muscle and I could. Now, kids tease me. It's kind of weird, though. In a way, I'm, I don't know. I'm, I'm almost glad it happened because I was going down a bad path and I wasn't going to get off. Well, I always wanted to have a life. Oh, I'm a Yankee. A Yankee. I mean, it changed my life drastically, but why lay down and die? I took those audio and videotapes from those individual interviews and from the drama workshops and I transcribed them. It was over 400 pages of text. That's what I used to write the play, those exact words. I then hired actors and I didn't hire the actors because the brain injury survivors would have a difficult time getting to rehearsals or memorizing their lines. It was because I knew if they sat in the audience and they watched the totality of their progress, that they would sense and immediately feel a sense of empowerment for how far they'd come. The actors who worked with the Puzzle Club members, they had the stipulation that they needed to get to know this person intimately so that the two could work together to create the person that was shown on stage. Well, the play was performed in many places in the U.S., it went on to become a film that has been distributed to hospitals and rehabilitation centers all over. PBS aired a documentary about our process, and I'd like to just show you one minute of a clip. You'll see a little bit of the rehearsal, a tiny clip of the actual film that was made from the play, and you'll hear some of the voices of the Puzzle Club members. The award-winning play premiered at the University of Montana in October of 2004. And because of audience interest and support, it was subsequently filmed so that hospitals and rehabilitation centers across the nation could have access to the play. On opening night, the Puzzle Club members, their families and friends, joined the sold-out crowd to experience their stories told theatrically. I don't think any of us were prepared for uh the performance. I, I think that initial when the big bang hits and just trying to show them falling down and then then if they can come back from there. I still have body chills. It's, I don't know if I'm honestly ready to watch it or not. I want to but honestly I don't know if I am. The first part's kind of scary. Brings back memories quick. I mean, it's been, it'll be 17 years to bring all that back right in one minute. It's devastating. I can remember the Big Bang. <laughs> that scared me. So scared of it. That's the truth. So as you can imagine, give me one more minute, two. As you can imagine, that experience had a profound impact on the Puzzle Club members. People were interested in who they would, who would they become, and they were interested in their stories. They had something to say, and they had a platform to say it on. So, of course, I interviewed them again about six months later to understand their sense of worth at this point. Life for me will never be what it was, but I have found a purpose. Well, I have my support group, the Puzzle Club, finding life's little pieces to make your life better. People who know me now, like, they think I'm a good person. Before, I didn't know that if you were hurt, you could still do things. <laughs> I'm training to become a nurse's assistant. Oh! I started a daycare. People said, Marilyn, you can't go back to work. I said, 
Why not? I'm alive and I'm worthwhile. Learning to control my anger. When I watched the play and the movie, I saw how angry and frustrated I was, and it's good because you need that in a play, but I don't want to be that person anymore. The reality is we died. <clears throat> the person we were before is gone, died. But the play showed us that person who came out after. Um, I'll show you one more short little clip from the Working on this play video. really reminded everybody involved that pain and tragedy aren't always the end. Sometimes they're just the beginning. I still work with people who have experienced a profound sense of loss because of something that has happened to them. In Scandinavia, this film has become popular, and I travel there to train doctors and physical therapists on how to use drama as a tool in the brain injury recovery process. Here in India, I work with young girls who have been rescued from the sex trade industry. They, too, are trying to rebuild their identity after experiencing a debilitating event. In the U.S., I have many different groups that I work with. The goal is always to help them see who they were before and to use the stage as a place to rehearse for who they want to become. And in all these cases, I find the same thing, that it doesn't matter if the person that they see when they look in the mirror is different from who they were before. No, what matters is that that person is seen, that that person is recognized, and that that person is valued. I hope what you can take from this talk today is not the fact that I had a stroke, but the idea that with every loss, we are being recreated. In India, it would be apt to say with every death, there is a rebirth. And the Puzzle Club members understood that. They understood that they had become a new, completely different person. And when they looked in the mirror, they saw that they were different, but... They were nonetheless complete. Thank you so much for your time.